All right. This is going to be a lot of fun. So my talk today is O'Day for the Soul, Spirituality in the Age of Biohacking. So how did I, a preacher's daughter, raised Republican, my idea, again, of rebelling was converting to Roman Catholicism a few years ago, become a cyborg. <laughs> uh, it's a little bit of a story, but I'll tell you this. It's all Jeff Moss's fault. So uh, several months ago, uh, I don't know how many of you folks remember this, but uh, Tribeca Film Festival teamed up with Mr. Robot and DEF CON to do this great display and game at the Tribeca Film Festival. There were a lot of challenges there. Remember, I'm, I'm Roman Catholic, so this is fine right here. It's sacerdotal, I swear to God. So we all uh, teamed up there, and I ended up as the hack master out of the middle of nowhere, running games. Uh, hopefully, I, I honored the name of Lost in that one. Uh, ran the challenge with a uh, RFID scanning and biohacking challenge, a pen test challenge, and a crypto challenge at the end of it. Found some great people. In fact, two of the people that won that challenge, and by winning, I mean they broke my game. <laughs> are here at DEF CON now. It was a great experience. So when we were doing that, I ended up just kind of out of the middle of nowhere on a planning call with Jeff and several of the people from Mr. Robot when Jeff said, uh, you know, Tara, I want to make sure that there's a biohacking component in this game to make sure that all of the villages that are going to be at Tribeca are represented. And I said, I'll make that happen. <laughs> So I, I ended up, I think, a week later on the phone with Nina right there in the back of the room, having a conversation with her in the week in which I got two bio implants, both an RFID chip and an IUD. And there's more to come on that a little bit later on. Having that conversation with her was quite illuminating. I realized that she'd be a, uh, a great person to, to reach out to because she was running Biohacking Village there at Tribeca. Got a chance to, to meet her there. She had already had an RFID chip implanted, and I said, what is the easiest way to get biohacking into this game that I want to run for everyone? And she said, well, what if we had them clone an RFID badge off of a chip that someone had embedded in their hand? And I said, that's a great idea. But how many people in here have ever run a game or an activity for a lot of strange people with varying skill sets? How many of you have experienced a zero point of failure, <laughs> a single point of failure in that game? Everybody has, very likely. I knew that if Nina had to go get coffee, we'd be in trouble. So I said, okay, make me your backup. <laughs> she hooked me up with a gentleman that I had never met before, and uh, his name was Emil Grofstra. He, uh, he spoke a little earlier today, I think, around 11 o'clock today about implants. Well, what he spoke about was what he did for me. I and my godfather have brunch after mass every Sunday. We talk about all manner of stuff. Uh, he's a a, 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 a tipsy novelist a lot of the time, so that's, that's quite a, a post-mass brunch to have. Emil showed up, unrolled a terrifying-looking kit full of medical equipment, and uh, I said, it's okay, I've had a mimosa, shove it in me. And he did, and uh, postponed to Tribeca, we had a really wonderful time there. Um, and then, I'll tell you this right now, um, in May, I, I showed up at Lockfest. In Seattle, this was the, uh, the U.S. lock sport competition, their, their national competition there. How many of you guys pick locks, right? So a lot of the folks there are very much into physical hacking. Turns out that, and again, how many of you have seen Mr. Robot at this point? Remember the cafe scene where there's the big square and the guy walks past and, and he scans the, the badge, the RFID badge to clone it, right? The gentleman that invented that square scanner uh, is Babak Javadi. You could actually go hang out with him down at the Tula Village if you want to. Um, and he reprogrammed my chip for me. Standing there, as he had his wireless scanner and rewriter, um, I said, he, he asked me, what do you want on it? And I said, I want a joke and a prayer. <laughs> and fortunately, uh, the gentleman, Deviant Olaf, was standing right there too, and he said, I have a suggestion. I said, what is that? He said, why not get Unicode 2020 embedded on your RFID chip? And I said, why? And he said, it's the Roman Catholic character for cross, and it's also the dagger. So you'll have literally Christ within you, and you'll never be able to not get a weapon through TSA again. <laughs> I died. <laughs> it was a terrible joke. That's why it's still here under my skin, right there. Christ within me, and I can choose what kind of scanning I want to the TSA now. I, I didn't think about that part, but it works out. So I have something really meaningful inside me, spiritually now, and that's where the cornerstone for this talk came about. The integration of technology with the body has some really interesting implications for spirituality and psychology. 
though certain kinds of body modification fall under theological jurisdiction due to their intended use, such as intrauterine, devi intrauterine devices or pacemakers, there are a lot of newer kinds of integrated technology that are optional and intended to interact with the physical world for data transfer or analytics. You all are enthusiasts for biohacking in this room, or at least want to know a little bit more about it. How many of you have some form of biohacking in you? And do count IUDs if you want to say so. Sure, so some of you are really enthused about this idea of what it means to have technology embedded in your body. What does it mean to have your heartbeat managed by technology? Anyone who's wearing a pacemaker absolutely is a biohacker, right? Your capacity to produce life. At what point do we start technically modifying our bodies for aesthetic as well as medical or biological purposes? And does that aesthetic modification count for spirituality as well? So, does cosmetic surgery count as biohacking? If so, why do so many prototypically feminine biohacks, like birth control or saline breast implants, seem to be ignored in the field of biohacking? More than anything else, when is tech spiritually enough? We're going to examine the doctrines of the world's major religions, medical definitions of humanity, the political and social implications of biohacking, and then finish up with some predictions brought to us through speculative fiction. Let's start with the doctrines of the world's major religions. And just saying that line right there means that I get to take a drink now. Let's start with some Buddhism. Buddhist monks have been practicing biohacking through meditation for millennia at this point, to the point that they can physically affect their bodies, their autonomic responses, the things we're not supposed to be able to control with intentional thought, with intentional thought. Perhaps they might call it the absence of intentional thought and a deeper connection. But there is no doubt at this point that the medical literature reflects the capacity of people who practice after a lifetime's worth of exercise, this kind of meditation to affect their bodies in ways that medical science can't necessarily always explain, but can absolutely detect at this point. It's a very interesting thing to see. The unperturbable mind state is what is the, is the goal of this kind of meditation. And the Theravada Buddhist monk Thanissaro Bhikkhu is the person who spent most of the time codifying this doctrine. It's a really fascinating one. So we start in Buddhism with the philosophy of a, of a worldview that is okay with the modification of the body intentionally. So it's generally a positive philosophy on bioethics due to the fact that in Buddhism, the mind and the body are two separate things entirely. The intention in Buddhism is to divorce yourself from the existence of the body through the deliberate use of your mind to separate yourself and bring yourself into enlightenment. The idea that you can completely divorce yourself from the desires of this world that are intimately tied to our physical being by mental practice is what makes it a very interesting religion when it comes to bioethics and biohacking. So this is part of the reason why Buddhism rejecting the notion of an inviolate body with a purpose based on biology why Buddhism is so accepting, for instance, of gay and transgender people. There is a, a large practicing subculture of gay and transgender people and the acceptance of it in many of this, the, the countries in Southeast Asia, Thailand specifically. The experience of Buddhists in integrating technology within themselves is not one that leads them from the literature that I've been able to examine to come into conflict with the doctrines of Buddhism and the Eightfold Way which is a lovely thing to, to conceive of and practice. I think it's a, uh, I, I, am not Buddhism, I am not Buddhist as we know, but it's, um, it is a lovely philosophy and I think many of us could do well with the kind of acceptance from our religions that Buddhism gives to gay and transgender people. Let's have a little bit of a conversation about Roman Catholicism. Everybody drink. All right. Sorry. Catholicism is not so friendly to the doctrine that they call transhumanism as opposed to biohacking. Part of the reason for this is that our neutral phrase biohacking, we, we don't in this room I think tend to think of biohacking as anything other than an activity as opposed to maybe necessarily a philosophy. If we start thinking about things like grinding, I suppose, or the deliberate modification of the body to shock as opposed to shock the external world, as opposed to an experience on the internal self of getting what you want out of it, then you start to have more of a philosophy to it. 
in reality, I think most of us are more interested in the autonomy to do with ourselves as we should so see, so see fit. The problem here is that Catholicism, as opposed to Buddhism, has a philosophy of the inviolate body, the intention that we should not damage the thing that was created for us in its perfect state. And this is very much the philosophy of medical and Western uh, religions that has crept into Western medical ethics. And we're going to explore most of, more of that in the second point. So Catholicism has an old and revered opposition stance on biohacking going back to about 2,000 years ago when this first started to become a conversation, although honestly the first literature really only began discussing it about 900 years ago, of the implantation of vinegar and a sponge uh, intravaginally to prevent conception. This was intended to be a permanent or switched out form of biohacking available in the natural world and used to literally hack bio. Right? This is as old as it gets. This was intended, of course, to prevent contraception in order to make sure that there were as many little new baby Catholics as possible. So the secondary item in Catholic doctrine, again, was the inviolate body. The notion that you would damage or change the body was a bad idea. It was thought that the closer you could retain yourself to the, the, the physiology that the second coming of the Messiah would bring forth, the better off you would be, which is why you would find so many catacombs full of preserved and mummified bodies from the 12th century onward, especially the very famous catacombs of Paris. I mean, if you've seen, I mean, who doesn't love the History Channel, right? You'll see the pictures of the catacombs in there. I love watching the History Channel. All right. Interestingly, and this is pretty fascinating, the largest single group of co-religionists, Christianity is about 2.1 billion people in the world, and Roman Catholicism is about 1.2 billion people in the world. So the largest group of co-religionists in the world also has the largest group of dissidents in it and the largest group of biohackers, women who use birth control, right? I have, like I said, two devices implanted in my body right now intended to hack my existence. One of them is absolutely against the doctrines of the Catholic Church. The other they haven't gotten around to forbidding yet. All right, so what does that actually mean? It means that there is a substantial number of people in the Catholic Church who definitely believe that there is a, an autonomous right to individual control and the ability to change one's body to suit oneself, especially on the advice of a doctor, which for instance this was, though it didn't have to be. That kind of dissidence is the kind of thing that creates a foment of intellectualism, and it's certainly one of the major reasons I'm interested in this question now. All right. There's no doubt, by the way, that the intrauterine device is biohacking, and yet somehow and for some reason, and again, I, I read a great story recently, I think it was on Salon or Slate, uh, about how weirdly, although women do so much biohacking through the use of cosmetics, implants, and birth control, they're often not considered biohackers. It's quite a fascinating thought. So there's, there's more to be discussed on that topic when we talk about the medical and social implications of this kind of biohacking. In Islam, there are fewer doctrinal sources for Islam, and part of that is the lack of communication between Western and Middle Eastern and African universities. Where much of the work in bioethics among medical colleges and colleagues is done. Cosmetic surgeries is quite a fascinating instant, instance. There is, in fact, in the An Nisa on page 119, a quote saying, And surely I will command them, and they will change Allah's creation. Whoso chooseth Satan for a patron instead of Allah is verily a loser, and his loss is manifest. This comes close to the same kinds of things that you would perhaps read in uh, St. Paul in the New Testament in the Bible, which is the kind of thing that, that would indicate to me, although not a scholar in Islamic doctrine, that perhaps traditionally it is not as welcome in Islam as it might be in Buddhism or in our next topic, in Wicca. All right. Wicca and many non-traditional religious beliefs. Wicca's primary read is, and it harm none, do as ye will. As a result, it lends itself to the greatest bodily autonomy of all of the major and older religions. Although we would now consider Wicca to be an alternative religion, it is certainly one of the naturistic religions that has existed in multiple different kinds of forms, and many people will argue about whether or not this is the pure or true one that exists now, but certainly has existed in a naturistic form for millennia. And interestingly, it is the most permissive of all of them when it comes to body modification. The reason why is this read, this primary uh, rule, you could consider it the golden rule of Wicca as opposed to uh, love your neighbor as thyself, 
is that it lends itself very much to the acceptance of what we might call in Western civilization victimless crimes. Things like non-exploitative sex work and body modification are much more accepted in Wicca as opposed to the other major religions. And that has to do, again, with uh, the, the lack of emphasis on community good as opposed to individual good becoming the collective good out of individual right action. This is very fascinating stuff to me, and I know I'm, I, I, I'm a nerd who's a technologist, but it is really interesting to look at this stuff and, and compare how the world has treated people who change themselves in all kinds of fascinating ways. So let's have a look, now that we've looked at the doctrinal positions on body modification, Let's start looking at the Western, um, at the, since I have a better grounding in it, the Western socio-political implications of biohacking as reflected in our spiritual beliefs and tribes. And really, at what point do I stop becoming human? Much of this is defined under medical ethics. Doctors seem to be very comfortable, and I am actually directly quoting Emil Grofstra on this one, very comfortable restoring people back to their original selves, but not so much at allowing people and aiding them in enhancing themselves. <clears throat> we're running squarely into the question of whether or not it's okay to enhance our bodies. The same question those medical students so studiously avoided, likely, when half of them were taking Adderall to get through their finals, right? <laughs> so we ask ourselves the question, what does it mean for those of us with, for instance, RFID chips? And, and what does it mean with those of us who have magnets who start to think of these new pieces of ourselves as part of ourselves? Sort of like an earring or a tattoo, I would suppose, but there's still this weird squick factor that people have when it comes to body modification like this, right? I think that uh, there's a weirdness. The rest of the population seems to be perfectly okay with tattoos, and yet somehow the idea that I have data stored on me in a subdermal state on an RFID chip as opposed to a peridermal state with embedded ink is just strange to people. It's still a message embedded under my skin that contains data and a point of reference, right? And yet, whether I've got a dagger tattooed on my skin or the RFID chip, it's a low frequency one by the way, has Unicode 2020 written in it, I've got a message and a piece of data stored on and in me. And I would feel, if I lost this, a loss greater than just the price of the circuit board, if that makes any sense. This has become meaningful to me in a way that is inexplicable by the tiny chip, which doesn't mean as much to me when it's stuck in my cat so the Humane Society can find her, right? So, maybe this has to do with a little bit of privilege, I'm not sure. Women biohackers have always existed, and interestingly enough, it's kind of the fringes of the society, even in, here in hacker culture, that are turning to biohacking. A woman with an IUD, and here we get back into the sociological implications of biohacking, breast implants, dyed hair, and a tanning bed tan, has used chemical and physical implants to cease producing human life, changed her shape, used ammoniac chemicals to change her physical appearance, and applied ultraviolet light to modify her body's natural melanin levels. So why do we think of women as consumers instead of body hackers when there's no substantial difference, and arguably they go much further than most of the people in this room? Maybe medical devices and cosmetic devices are in a different class of squick. If our society deems a device medically necessary, then the weight of social approbation falls in the direction of permitting, accepting, and then expecting that modification to our bodies like a pacemaker. So how many parts of a person can be replaced or removed without having them be considered non-human? There are world-class athletes that have artificial limbs and we don't consider them non-human. That question considers, con continues to not be answered as we keep treating people who are like this as edge cases instead of the future of humanity. I got an IUD and an RFID chip in that same week. I promise you the IUD has a far larger impact on my life and biology but the chip does, but it doesn't seem to count somehow. There's an uncomfortable lesson here about women's health, the perception of the importance of edginess in biohacking, and perhaps simply a question of there not being enough women on the edges of this research who can assert the importance of medical alterations as biohacking. Let's just keep our eyes open for that perception and stamp it out where we find it. There's a lot of opportunity here and let's keep it open to everyone. So as I start to conclude this uh, awesome little sermon, let's talk a little bit about speculative fiction. All right. My Twitter bio says I'm a Trexpert and I'm about to lay some on you. Let's talk about Seven of Nine and Star Trek Voyager. 
that's not a have to drink, that's a get to drink because I just get to hold forth all I want to. I've got the microphone and you can't stop me. Seven of Nine and the Borg Collective. Interestingly enough, when Seven of Nine was disconnected from the Borg Collective, okay, everybody in here who hasn't heard of Star Trek, can there's the door. Um, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, Seven of Nine was a Borg. Raise your hands if you know the Borg, just making sh good, we're fine then. So a collective of cyborgs who share intelligence and Seven of Nine is disconnected from them to travel with a Star Trek crew. One of the most fascinating parts about Seven of Nine is her development as an individual and her expectation of exactly where the limitations of her bodily autonomy and the rights of other people exist. There's a semi-imaginary place, and we only discover this much later in Star Trek Voyager, called Unimatrix Zero. This is a semi fictional place, almost you might consider it somewhere between a role-playing game and a collective hallucination among Borg who are both connected and disconnected from the collective, where they can all experience a euphoric and, um, and very Elysian existence as they found themselves before they were ever connected to the Borg collective. It's their version of heaven, and it is the reward for the Borg who serve the collective. It's a fascinating look at how a culture might develop out of the lack of culture. Seven of Nine, interestingly enough, throughout the, throughout the series, has no problem whatsoever altering crew members, with or without their permission, with her own Borg nanites in order to save their lives, since she views saving life as a greater good than necessarily preserving a person's autonomy. And the conflict between those two choices is where we start having that conversation about the use of technology to make someone different than they are. How about Buffy the Vampire Slayer? Willow Rosenberg was someone they called a techno-witch, and that wasn't a compliment to her abilities. It was that she was, she was creating a beautiful character, a beautiful person who was both technologically adept and spiritually aware. By the sixth season, we actually see her integrating herself into the internet through the use of mental powers. And again, this is speculative fiction we're looking at here. But techno-witch, is not necessarily a classification that is non-existent or fictional. There are people out there who exist a great deal on the internet and have these kinds of spiritual beliefs and who would tell you that they feel the existence of the internet as part of themselves. How many of you have read Richard Morgan's Altered Carbon series? It's a wonderful, wonderful series that has to do, yeah, great, that has to do with what happens when we can store the mind independent of the body and slip the body and slip the mind into new meat suits. The question of whether or not a person is still the same person is partially answered by Morgan when he discusses the fact that people have different spiritual connections to those around them based on the gender of the meat suit that they've been inserted into. I find that particularly fascinating since he found that the female meat suits seemed to have a greater connection to a Mother Earth character or a Gaia, a goddess, and the male characters tended to have much more of the, the, the chemical relationship to a sun god. This is, this is very advanced technology hearkening back to a very, very old religion from which many of the religions that many of the people in here may still practice. Ultimately, the question of whether or not you're still human past a certain number of implants has to do with the way that you view the world and experience your own spirituality. The question that I keep coming back to is, if I am deliberately going against the precepts of my religion, which I absolutely am right this moment, at what point do I, do I stop by my religion being considered to be human or part of that religion? Is it the same point? I'm not entirely sure, but I can tell you this. The only way to answer that question for each and every one of you is within you. It's between you and your goddess. Any questions? Go ahead. Sure. I'll repeat it back. That's it's called Altered Carbon, the Altered Carbon series. I highly recommend Richard Morgan. The question was, what? It, who's the gentleman who created the, the fictional series Altered Carbon? It's Richard K. Morgan. I actually like Market Forces best out of all of his books. Other questions? Go ahead. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Chemical enhancement. Interesting. Uh, I don't know where the line is between the six Aleve I took this morning and high-powered blotter, uh, you know, blotter acid, but I can tell there's a great deal of acceptance in this culture for occasional use of chemicals. <laughs> Sacerdotal. Question. Um, can you repeat the name of the group again? Gyne Punk? Grinder group of women? Okay, well, clearly I need an intro. Tweet me. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Have you read Scalzi's Lock In? Scalzi's Lock In. Oh, Scalzi. John Scalzi. Oh, yeah, totally. Oh, God, what a great, great one. Oh, yeah. Mm hmm. It is good. Somebody needs to start tweeting the names of all these great books, but just if you haven't seen the, 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 the character concept of Seven of Nine, start there first and then go on to the advanced work with Richard K. Morgan and John Scalzi. Next question. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would I say that there is no absolute truth behind the question, what is and is not human? I think that people that say that there is one are people who don't belong in this community of explorers. Are you talking about uh, a, like a singular truth behind this mm -hmm. question or singular truths as a whole? Singular truths are practiced by two out of the five religions that I just discussed. Um, there's actually another major world religion that'll, that my brother and stepdad are part of. They're bikers. I mean, don't ever tell me that somebody doesn't have a spiritual connection to their Harley. Uh, <laughs> But I'll tell you right now that the people that think there is one answer to a question, they, they probably didn't show up to DEF CON to begin with, right? Um, and yet the folks that, that have that viewpoint are definitely the ones I find myself really engaging with to see if I have a moral compass in this area. I, I don't have a good answer for you, basically. And what I would actually encourage you to do is you're interesting enough that I want to continue the conversation. So like, hit me up on Twitter and we'll DM about this. And I'll talk about it forever. I'll, talk your ear, I'll type your ear off. Next question. Mm -hmm. or, you know, the moral to the legal definition of human, because to me, mm -hmm. you know, something like, you know, meat suits type mm -hmm. technology in today's Catholic-dominated mm -hmm. U.S. government would say they're not human at all. So, again, we're getting to some really interesting questions about what is a human and what is not. When I went and literally Googled what is human, uh, the first thing that popped was a Webster definition. I don't know that I'm comfortable letting Merriam-Webster define my existence as a human being. I can tell you that medical ethics define the existence of life in humans as the existence of electrical impulses through the brain stem indicating a continuing electrical current through the brain. That is the definition of life, even if it is not necessarily the definition of human. Other than that, I think you have to look to biologists for the actual species qualification. I, I would say medically and as a scientist, which I certainly am one, it would require the combination of two things. One is the existence of those electrical impulses at the brainstem, and two would require being homo sapiens, the, the scientific qualification. Last question. Yes. How do you feel about the Olympics Yes. Players, yes. Excellent question. Good question now is the Olympics are now opening up in Rio, which is how do I feel about uh, athletes enhancing themselves with drugs? I think that every single organization has the right to define the, the, the line at which they will accept people to participate in their group. Remember, the Olympics is not a nonprofit organization. It's a for-profit business, and they absolutely have the right to contractually specify who can and cannot participate. Legally, they can do as they wish. Do I think it's right? I think that if everyone's playing on the same field, it's a fair competition. And that past that point, no one who does not abide by the rules of a for-profit company and yet signs the contract to participate in is on the upside of ethics, if that makes sense. All right, I think that's probably the last question. Thank you so very much. I hope I did it right. <laughs> Thanks so much. Oh. At 4.30, if you'd like to have more of a conversation, I'll be down in the vendor area at Breakpoint Books uh, signing women in tech. So come on down there and chat with